Um, the environment. Should we care about the environment? Uh, oh yes, look at the sun outside, so I'm sure everybody would rather be outside than inside, at least today. Um, so, I, uh, unfortunately, I haven't done a good job of preparing myself in terms of... I've known Vicky for 20 years, I think, maybe, around that, not much less, anyway. And so I could have gathered quite a lot of embarrassing photographs from uh, <laughs> over the years. But uh, no, I failed on that uh, account. So we have known each other for very long, but we haven't worked on nanotops for that amount of time. We, we work on other subjects before. And we worked together, well, we were at the same university at Napier, uh, teaching with colleagues and so on. So we'll, our fields did come together, but not in, uh, in the field of nano uh, uh, toxicology. So I, I give you a little, the job I did preparing this was more kind of reflecting on um, what we did together, I guess, and how we followed the, the field as, as it was developing. So uh, this is the outline, why consider the environment, nanomaterials through the life cycle, early investigations, um, the link to industry, stakeholders, um, you know, regulators, very important, but also give it the environmental context. As you've heard, uh, we talked about nanoparticles, of course, is the core of it, but we also mentioned the, the fact that they are, you know, in uh, products, of course, um, and how they actually, the organisms see them, you know, the cells see them and then the organisms, so the increased realism is important in that context. Cross species, uh, because the environment, obviously, we talk about species normally, we don't tend to um, so much focus on, on cell lines, or, or cells anyway, on cell lines. Um, so we, we, we first and foremost think about the organisms themselves, but of course we, we look at uh, the wide range of aspects. And then, again, the safe by design, the, and then using this information um, in, well, in the real world, I guess. So why the environment? This is a, a, you know, a very simple diagram, so that to remind everybody that we enjoy a clean environment, you know, we enjoy um, whatever you want to do, um, either walk or, or, or uh, swim or, or sail, but of course, very importantly, and I had some slides, but I had to delete, otherwise we'll be here all day. Uh, in terms of the importance, the economic importance of a clean environment to the UK economy, for example, or the, there's some reports, you can actually put that, how much, how many jobs, how much GDP actually comes from the marine environment, for example, and if it's not clean, at least uh, uh, the, the living resources would not be, um, uh, uh, you know, available at the same level. And of course, we can get affected by a dirty environment, so it goes without saying. So, are nanomaterials, so this is questions we were being asked a while ago. Of course, now people are aware that uh, this question is, is you know, is, called, is, is position is, is quite a relevant one. But I guess, um, you know, going back a few years, this was new, and now uh, here you're just uh, basically reinstating. Um, again, the, the sun doesn't help with the contrast, as we heard before, but I'm sure you can see the wide range of applications which we heard already, but I would like to highlight some of the ones that are actually environmental. And, uh, you know, they actually used to, well, they are discharged directly environment to clean up contaminated water, contaminated, was mentioned before by Vicky. <laughs> Uh, but also on uh, the surface of buildings or surface of, you know, uh, of a glass or, so, or, or other um, uh, construction, for example, and that means that they will end up in the environment. So there's a lot of relevance here in terms of the, the, the particles ending up in the environment. Then, directly. Then if you think about the life cycle from, you know, extraction of the materials themselves to actually production, using, and end of product, there's many opportunities for these particles to end up in the environment in, in different forms. And from the pristine to the modified ones, so you can see here, you know, if you have a discharge, it could be even to the air. And then, of course, we have your, our exposure here. We've talked a lot about the human exposure, now in terms of consumers or in terms of the occupational. I would like to think about the environment, of course. This is some of the applications that end up in the environment. I mentioned the surface of buildings, for example. This ends up in the environment, cosmetics, uh, end of life, going into the air, uh, materials that have silver or whatever that ends up in the wastewater treatment and ends up in the environment. So the literature is quite wide-ranging now, demonstrating what might happen. 
for example, the nanomaterials which end up in the wastewater um, system. We, we actually just published a couple of papers in, on that um, like last month. Okay, so this is again from an early paper from uh, Switzerland. Um, these are particles from facades in buildings. And interesting, this is the early paper, so again, some evidence again, um, these particles get into the environment. But the interesting thing is that some of them, so this is titanium dioxide in paint, some of them are associated with organic matter, but some of them are actually seen as nearly pristine particles, nearly. Um, so organisms can actually encounter particles themselves, not just you know, a big entangled mass that, say, will deposit and, and just go into the sediment. So there's a propensity, you know, potential. Uh, exposure and, and nanoparticles. And then just this diagram, you can see basically the organisms themselves produce a lot of organic matter, of course. So the organic mass, well, first let's think about the environment. It's got different composition in terms of salinity or you know, organic carbon, etc. So as the particles get to the environment, they will face those uh, conditions. And then the organisms themselves produce organic matter. Uh, they, f they live on the sediments, they live in the water column, they live in, in, on soils. You know, there's a big interaction between all of them. Primary producers, they might be eaten by primary consumers, then by be eaten by fish. There be other chemicals in the environment, which now, again, there starts being evidence might associate themselves with particles and indeed be more, become more bioavailable. We have some data now that uh, uh, links to that, but not always. So again, that might depend on the chemical and the particle itself. And of course, there's a link to, uh, to food, potentially, that is important to consider. Um, this is, again, some of the things that we talk, we were discussing going back 10 years. Uh, the fact that there was a law uh, out there in terms of particle toxicology, so I actually dug out uh, an early slide that we, we had prepared. And, you know, what things can we learn from toxicology when we design the nano ecotoxicology work? So, you know, the fact that the particles do behave in a certain way, and the fact that we have some knowledge already from toxicology that we can uh, somehow learn from when designing the uh, environmental studies. Uh, this is an uh, early team. Uh, uh, this, I don't know when they were taken, probably 10 years ago. Uh, but, you know, we were talking about these things and, uh, you know, there's criminality there in terms of, well, there's interest in nanotechnology was starting, the, the study becoming mainstream, obviously. It already started many years back. Um, but the, the report of the Royal Society of 2004, so before that and during that time is when we were talking. Uh, in terms of the interest, the cross interest in the environment. Um, so um, the work started uh, and it started by doing quite a few exposures in the lab. And this is something obviously that we observe. Um, uh, organisms do get entangled in nanoparticles. Particles cover the surface of organisms. You know, we have several, they have mainly titanium dioxide and, and carbon black which is quite nice to study um, because, well, they're quite wide-ranging, so obvious to study, and of course, Vicky's team has been studying them for, for many years, but they're quite nice to study because we can see them very well. So you can see them, uh, if they're black, they're carbon black, if they're white, they're titanium, and you can see how they cover the organisms. Um, uh, from marine, you have some marine organisms from freshwater ones, so uh, this is not just a ghost stream, it's just covered with titanium dioxide. Some of them are transparent, so you can actually see it in the gut too. And this is, uh, um, I'll talk about this, this is gametes from a marine organism which has been entangled in, in carbon black. Uh, so physical impairment is obviously a, a, an important aspect. Uh, then Philip uh, did, got a grant from um, DEFRA and CSL at the time. And he did some work looking at poly beads, uh, polystyrene beads in, in uh, Daphnids. And uh, he did demonstrate that not only they go into the gut, but they actually translocate to other parts of the body. And this appeared, uh, it was just a bit of news on EST. Uh, I gave the talk myself, he was in, in, uh, in the audience, but I gave the talk, so I get to, to be named. But it's actually his, uh, his picture. And, in, and later on, one of our students highlighted that even in, the, in Italy, they have picked up on this. This was just a mainstream journal, uh, newspaper. It was a little bit later, but it seemed to have mentioned that uh, this is not a scientific paper, as you might uh, know. It was picked up as being basically the 
the key was that the particles were taken by organisms and they were translocating to other parts of the body. So there was a potential for persistence there, I guess. And even the paper was then published later on, and we compared the, the exposure to smaller particles to larger particles. You can see that in the gut, it's quite well uh, full of these particles, but it's also associated with other parts, indeed even associated with some of the eggs uh, uh, in, in these tafnids. Um, okay, so do you have here a little uh, uh, further uh, representation? Philip also compared um, the effects, again using the daphnids, uh, of smaller particles and large particles of carbon black, and what he uh, found out um, it was that indeed the smaller particles seemed to lead into higher levels of mortality at lower concentrations. So the lines uh, is a mortality, and also um, the, because they are little shrimp-like organisms, they had to shed the carapace to grow. So there was, again, um, uh, another end point, which was basically they weren't molting enough, so they weren't growing and so on. So you know this indicated, uh, again, the higher toxicity of the smaller particles compared to the larger ones. And a, a longer test looking at um, reproduction indicated a similar uh, results, so higher toxicity, so lower reproduction associated with this exposure to smaller particles as, as compared with the larger particles. Uh, we had another project, a bit like this was again across universities, uh, funded by the Joint Environment Human Health Program, so there's a variety of backers in terms of finances behind it, and uh, where we look at the comparisons across invertebrate fish and human mo models. So, um, it was toxicity, uh, as I said, so there were cell lines, there were invertebrates, there were fish, but also uptake uh, uh, and uh, using cattle uh, models. Not, not, uh, not the best contrast, but similar to what uh, was mentioned before. So, you know, this is what I, I've... Uh, oh, the project was across uh, 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 fields, if you want, and also across institutions. And... Uh, some of the some of the results that I'll, I'll I'll show you here. So what we have here is a comparison of human hepatocytes, looking at uh, LDH assay, and here we have the primary trout hepatocytes. So side by side, so it's probably not been done uh, before at the time. And uh, similar ranking again with higher toxicity associated with nano, although there seem to be from these tests that much lower, to uh, sorry, higher toxicity associated with human hepatocytes as compared to the primary trout hepatocytes. Um, the DAF needs again indicated similar to what we'd seen before for the uh, for the carbon black, so the l higher level of toxicity associated with the nano as compared to the to, to the larger particles. And looking at bioavailability at longer term assays, um, a variety of uh, tissues uh, were looked at. Um, we have liver here, uh, organs liver here, and I think it was gallbladder also. And you can see here that, okay, there was a dose response, but only at the uh, intestine seemed to be a, a difference between the, the bulk and, and the nano. Yes, so there was uh, gallbladder and, and gill also, but I won't show the results here. So uh, Birgit and, uh, and um, Philip also, you know, as part of the well, cross comparison, they also look at, of course, a variety of other particles. So we've already seen some of the uh, carbon black and the silver, but when comparing them, this is just to say not all nanoparticles are the same, of course. Some are going to be much more toxic than others, and in this case, just by comparing these, you can see the carbon black and lower toxicity. So uh, silver would, uh, would be one of the, uh, well, the rank is higher uh, toxicity. The silver uh, barrier also look at uh, exposures with cerium dioxide, and uh, it wasn't um, well, it wasn't considered toxic to the point of uh, leading to high levels of mortality, but what she found when the organisms were exposed to nano, the organisms were much smaller, basically, so they're not growing well, so they're obviously not feeding, uh, feeding well, and, and although the mortality was not observed in, in, with significance, uh, there was obviously they, they were suffering. 
Uh, we also uh, co-supervised the first uh, study carried on by N and Nielsen on marine systems. And so, as, as I mentioned before, one, one of the pictures, she worked on one of the marine algae, but interestingly, she looked at different stages of development, so she actually exposed different stages and followed them up. Uh, she had already uh, worked, she was a postdoc working uh, with us, we had already uh, been working previously with these state systems, and indeed she observed, as I said before, when it becomes as associated with uh, the clusters of carbon bags, so it was very much uh, a, a physical kind of uh, um, mediated by physical uh, condition, if you want. Uh, there was no observation of internalization of the particles. We're talking carbon black here. It was not observed inside the, um, this was a picture of actually the, the early development of Zygot. And overall, um, the observation uh, led to um, conclusion that there was reduced fertilization and changing orientation of the body axis. So I'll show you from the first picture, it's important that to orientate themselves well in relation to the light. So it could be because of the, uh, you know, the shading effects, the entanglement effects were preventing that to happen. So now we mentioned about realism. Realism is important and we have been discussing this endlessly. Even last week as part of OECD meeting, we were discussing about how should we present, how should we prepare media uh, when we expose our organisms. So one of the discussions is obviously dispersing the particles. As we put the particles in the water, this is at time zero. As you can see at time 24, they all go to the bottom, mostly. Okay, this is just one example with two types of particles. Some particles are better dispersed than others, so they don't go, you know, they don't deposit within 24 hours necessarily. Some might deposit within a few hours anyway. So, you know, we've been discussing this a lot. Um, what's the best method? Should we improve dispersion? And one of the ways of doing so is by using organic matter, um, because all rivers have organic matter, so they have organic matter. So if you add something that exists already in the environment, they might help with dispersion. And indeed, here you have different concentrations in this one river humic acid, and you can see as you increase the concentration up to 10 milligrams per liter, so it's actually not that high, then even with 100 milligrams per liter, you can see that those um, dispersions stay, those particles stay in dispersions uh, um, most likely. So this is something that, as I said, is still being discussed as we speak, if it should be implemented in guidance and notes for, for OECD testing. Um, indeed, we, when we compare the toxicity of particles, um, this is our old titanium dioxide, um, but different um, func functionalizations and different sizes. We have smaller ones, well, smaller, very small one, 50 nanometers, 75, 25, and larger. If we do them with, uh, without humic acid, the blue, you can see some of them are quite toxic. Well, not quite toxic because this is not that small, but what I'm saying is that you really see a decrease from the, or some toxicity anyway associated with exposures. Others not really uh, using this endpoint in this organism. Uh, but the interesting thing is that as you add um, humic acid, you might change the outcome of the assay quite dramatically. So that's why we should consider this carefully in, in terms of changing assays do uh, change the outcome potentially. And as you can see here, it doesn't, it is not homogeneous across the board necessarily. Um, it's interesting when looking at the, the organisms without uh, the humic acid and, and following exposures, you can see that for some of them, and this is not necessarily related with, with the size, some of them seem to have the body covered, whereas others uh, do not. And interestingly, the one, uh, this one here, was one seemed to have benefited most by having the, the addition uh, of humic acid. Um, wanted to talk, which we're talking about functionalization, we're talking about cross species. Um, it does, it is important to realize that uh, these are standard test species for OECD tests, so that's why we, we use them a lot in the lab. So we're talking here about uh, an algae, we're talking about, again, the Daphne, then the worm, because, you know, we've mentioned them, them before the algae not so much. But you can see here, by using particles exactly the same size but with different functionalization, some of them are much toxic. Well, first, if you look at uh, the y-axis, um, the Daphnis are more sensitive than, the, say, the worms, for example. Then we're looking in, in terms of the uh, uh, toxicity for the different organisms is also different here. So we need to consider that carefully. When, uh, well, if you've considered, for example, safe by design, it is an important aspect too. Okay, I've already talked about uh, 
the y-axis and, and the ranking of toxicity. So it's not dissimilar, uh, too dissimilar at least for the Daphne's and now and the Corella, but it is uh, uh, definitely different for the lumbiculus. And interestingly, the defects do not necessarily correlate with the solution aggregate size of the potential. So we did do uh, this, uh, you know, assess the solution, assess, I, um, I won't show you the data because there's no more time, but we have all this information. Um, uh, okay. So on, on another paper, another couple of papers, we actually look at uptake and operation and so on. So I think it's interesting to actually summarize some of the results just from the toxicity that we actually, in this case, we did observe internalizers because we exposed the algae to, to these particles and we did observe some internalization of the, of the silver particles, well, not all of them. It isn't clear uh, why, uh, how exactly there might be if the, the membrane was, was damaged, for example. Um, this solution that this was already uh, mentioned, the solution in the media, you know, related toxicity. But interestingly, we fed the, this algal exposed to particles to the Daphnids, and we found that uh, silver could be assimilated from ingested algae uh, exposed, so the algae exposed to the, nanopart to the nanoparticles. Um, those, they are not eliminated completely uh, from, the, from the Daphnid, uh, but interestingly, for the algae um, uh, exposed to the nanoparticles, food seemed to be the, the dominant pathway of intake of silver, whereas for the, the salt, the silver salt, the waters uh, seem to be the, the major source. Um, just just face, uh, briefly talking about following up this uh, safe by design, uh, this was a, a project in association with uh, a variety of industrial partners who provided the particles, and the idea is that we did uh, tests across a range of models again, both in vitro and in vivo, and then the, the particles would have been uh, modified, and then we did the, the tests again. Uh, these are the particles that we ended up testing on, so there was a very large panel, so it was quite a busy uh, project. Again, you can't see much here, but so some images of the uh, of those particles and suspensions. We uh, ended up not doing the hydrophobic because it was extremely difficult to suspend. You know, it's just basically all stuck together. Uh, but this is just a heat map and interesting. So we did again our three uh, model species. Uh, this is for the in vitro test and you can see, so the green is lower toxicity, the red is highest toxicity. So, you know, the, the different models seem to be able to identify toxicity. So which was quite interesting for our cross comparison. Um, mostly. I mean, there were some of them that would seem to be more sensitive, for example, to zinc as compared to the environment which they were less in terms of the tests that I'm representing here. But interesting, if you ignore the bit here, uh, there were some modifications being done for the particles, as I said before. One of them was the, the quantum dots. They were highlighted to be some of the most toxic. So they modify with zinc uh, um, sulfide shell and uh, you know indeed we observe a decrease in toxicity across all the models this is uh, uh, the macrophage so you, the, the non-modified and modified again the same we saw a decrease in toxicity uh, for the environmental models finally Vicky has mentioned the Sun project I don't want to highlight uh, some of the results she indicated we have similar results in terms of the ranking of toxicities of the modified copper but one of the things with the Sun project is to look at longer term tests so in this case it's actually a, a, a snail um, that we've been testing on again not OECD test species but quite a standard ecotox species but normally as a indicated in my previous um, examples, we tend to do shorter tests, often, not always, but often, most often are shorter tests. So this project really wanted to look further and to go into longer tests. And you can see here quite a big change in toxicity when exposed for three days. It's actually nearly perfect in terms of, you know, the high toxicity. This is to be expected, of course, one could say, but it's something that needs to be taken into consideration in terms of risk characterization. And similarly, when we talk about, uh, for example, here we talk about mortality. In the next uh, slide, we're talking about reproduction. We're talking about number of eggs, for example. And you can see that the values to, you know, if you, if you want to, to see a reduction of 50%, for example, uh, are much uh, smaller compared with the, with the previous uh, mortality. 
Um, now, I mentioned about the importance of the method. You know, um, it's, very, it's very difficult for regulators, industry, for stakeholders to summarize the literature when you come across one paper that is used humic acid, the other one hasn't. One paper is suspending using method A, and the other paper is suspending using method B. And this is as part of NanoReg. We've been working on protocol development again. And this look at a couple of, par well, few, yeah, a couple of particles, really um, silver and, and multi-walkable nanotubes. And you can see that depending if you suspend on with bad sonicate on probe sonicate, you change the toxicity. You know, it could be more, more toxic if you use the, the probe or less uh, toxic. So something that needs to be explored. This can be explain, I think, using some chemistry and understanding how our different uh, nanoparticles, talking about silver as opposed to uh, uh, multiple kind of nanotubes, I expect to work in these conditions, but you know, it's something that will need clear information and clear guidance. Vicky has mentioned that, and I only put this here because I think it's really important. This is really paving the way, you know, again, the meeting I was last week, people were talking, not as much of this project as such, although it comes up a lot, is about the grouping and the work has been done to kind of leading um, into the future in terms of providing guidance where we want to be or need to be in terms of regulating uh, the use of nano, uh, nanomaterials. So I think it's important to kind of, you know, think about the impact of this work has, has had in, in progressing the subject. Uh, we, we're working also, I'm, I'm contributing to uh, developing a, this new guidance document, which we do on the, uh, September 2016, so there will be new um, information coming from OECD regarding the testing of uh, nanomaterials in environmental systems. And we, as, as a team, have contributed you know, to a variety of communications or reports from the, from the scientific, um, European Commission scientific committees. And of course, you know, now contributing to uh, nano and, and pro -save. So I think the, the path we've been has been very rewarding and uh, hopefully successful also in contributing some new data and information towards understanding what's happening to nanomaterials in, in the bodies of organisms, uh, in the environment, uh, being part of it too. Uh, so nanotoxicology has obviously learned a lot from uh, nanotoxicology, of course, Eco is just, you know, not nanotoxicology is just environmental, um, it, nano ecotoxicology is an environmental nanotoxicology anyway, so not surprising there's, there's a strong link. So collaboration interaction is, uh, is essential. There's a lot of text here, but it's just to say, you know, the environment is really important in terms of affecting what happens to the nanomaterials, so we need to understand that better. Uh, we, we know they can be taken and translocated. We know that the gills are particularly sensitive, for example. I didn't show you any data on that, but we have that. Uh, from muscles, for example, we've been working on. We now, and I indicated that they can be passed on through the food chain. Not all are equally toxic, um, but you know, often we can compare uh, models, and they, they they tend to rank similarly. Not always, but you know, often. Physical impacts are obviously continue to be a problem and will be a problem, but these are linked to uh, how much. If there's a lot of nanomaterials, of course, physical impacts are going to be important. Some of the tests that have been done in studies, maybe they've used too many nanomaterials, i.e. unrealistic concentrations, so of course the physical impacts are, are higher. Uh, so longer time studies are important in populations, so looking at uh, you know different uh, stages, this is something that we have been doing, for example, with the snail's work from the eggs, embryos, uh, you know, juveniles, adults, etc. Interaction with other chemicals is also important, you know, this carrying into, into the cells, or, or indeed uh, making them less toxic. And of course, I mentioned that in our safe operations. Um, yes, so everybody has uh, mentioned people who have uh, contributed, of course, because the work I've, I've described has been done by, by everybody here, and, and some of them there. Um, the funders, of course, and uh, yeah. Thanks very much, Vicky, for contributing to this and making this possible, and uh, indeed, very well done. Thanks, Teresa. Fascinating images.
on this screen it was a little bit better, oh, but yes, still good, but still yeah. impressing. I have a question. You mentioned at the beginning that you have a release of uh, nanoparticles from cosmetic products into water. So if I give a, you, uh, some very general presentations for the public, they usually ask, can we still use uh, sunscreen which contains titania or zinc nanoparticles, what is the correct answer to this question? It because they usually ask, so, but if it's not uh, harming humans, what is then if we, it's released into the environment? It's a difficult one. Um, I, I tend to think, well, zinc, the, the main effects I would say is via this solution, right? We've had a student, I didn't mention her, but it was also a joint student, speaking and I, looking at zinc particles, and I think for, at least for those particles, most of the effects are likely to have been through the solution. Um, now, when they dissolve, um, they, and what we do in the lab is not exactly the same that happens in the environment. What happens in, with silver, as everybody knows, it can be very toxic. This is a dissolved silver, it can be very toxic in the laboratory, but when we actually look at the, um, in the environment, and after many years of using silver in a variety of industries, we haven't replicated the kind of toxicity in the environment. And the reason is because it binds with sulfide chloride, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, titanium tends to be less toxic, in, in, as you've seen, the very high concentrations, 100 milligrams. Although not all papers, some papers seem to indicate lower toxicity to environmental species. The issue is to do with. Um, with potential photocatalytic, you know, reactions that make it worse. So, we actually have a project now looking at um, suntan lotion, so in, in impacts on coral systems. So, um, so we're going to, I thought you were going to ask me about concentrations. We're working on that. There's some people who have done their work, as you know, by NOAC and so on, but not in like coastal areas where there's a lot of people swimming, How you know, so we're trying to estimate concentrations. The effects, well, I think the jury is still out for that. And I think what we should do is to try to highlight which, for example, forms, and this is already been done, what forms of titanium, which forms maybe of other materials I use in, um, in cosmetics, tend to be more toxic, and then concentrate on the ones. Because titanium, as you know, can be quite varied, and concentrate on the ones that are less toxic. So go for the safe part of the design. So I think it's still, diff I wouldn't say stop using them altogether now, but. Any more questions? I'd just like to ask about, uh, both you and Vicky talked about uh, modifying surfaces to make them less toxic. Uh, I just wonder whether you think that regulation will start to demand that if you put a, a particle for approval, they will ask to see whether you've looked at modifying the surface to try and minimize such toxicity in future? I don't think they will do it now, but I think they might well do it in the future. The problem of doing that is that you don't know um, if the modification, as you mentioned, still allows the particle to be used for the purpose it was designed for. Right? So this needs to be assessed. So if this carbonate or whatever it is uh, makes the copper, less, uh, copper oxide less toxic, but is that, okay, maybe for that application it works, and then fine, then it can be legislated, but it needs more evidence, and they just say, okay, for that specific application, if you do this modification, it makes it much less toxic, but still effective, then go ahead. So I think that is possible, but it needs more data to substantiate that um, action. I think um, Trace is exactly right. The issue at the moment is as soon as you modify that particle, if the company wants to make a claim that that particle is safer than the one they would have used before, they will have to go through all the regulatory tests to prove it. And that's the hurdle at the moment. 